Our next speaker is Lynn Cox, um, debate three bubbles and UV absorption. Okay, uh, can you hear me in the back? Good. Okay, I'm very grateful to Pratik and Biman and the organizers for putting this together. Um, it's been a very interesting conference. And I'm also glad that you've heard about the Fermi bubbles all day. I don't need to spend any more time introducing them. I'm going to spend uh, this talk discussing the UV observations that we have put together on the Fermi bubbles. And in particular, what have we learned about the physical conditions and the kinematics, the chemistry of the gas in the Fermi bubbles? Uh, before I do that, uh, I'm going to introduce a little bit about the foreground, because if you want to study the Fermi bubbles in UV absorption, you really have to understand what's going on in the disk and the halo of the Milky Way, because all our lines of sight pass through the halo. And really understanding the foreground is, I think, a key part to figuring out what's happening with the UV absorbers. And the way we really understand inflows and outflows in the Milky Way halo uh, with UV lines and at 21 centimeters in radio observations is with high velocity clouds. So this is an old sky map showing the H1 clouds that are either outflowing or inflowing above speeds of 100 kilometers per second in the LSR. So this is the stuff that we have to look through. There's a lot of material moving away from the galaxy. Some of this is at several hundred kilometers per second. So this can mimic what a galactic center or a Fermi bubble component could look like. So we have to spend some time um, discussing how we discriminate between a a Fermi bubble component and a general high velocity cloud component. And I'll be talking about that as we go on. So this is the map of the high velocity clouds in neutral gas, but we can study them in the UV. And then we now have several hundred sight lines with cost observations from Hubble. And if you take a line like silicon-3, which is a very strong metal line in the UV, you can detect this line, and it turns out about 77% of all the directions. So the sky covering fraction of UV high velocity clouds is very high. You take any direction through the halo, you've got more than a 75% chance of intercepting some gas. And again, this is the type of uh, foreground material that we have to be able to distinguish from the galactic center. Now, uh, I've been working for several years with a big group of people, including Ron here, uh, Blair Savage, Jay Lockman, uh, Tanvir Kareem, who's a student working with me on this, and many others, uh, focusing on understanding uh, from the UV perspective, what's going on. We've got four papers out so far. I'm gonna discuss um, two papers that look at individual sight lines where we can really drill down into the details of the absorption lines. And then we have two surveys as well. Wrong one on Monday discussed the Northern survey very nicely, so I don't need to go into that much. We uh, have also put out a Southern Sky survey recently too that I'll get to at the end. So the first sight line we looked at was this Quasar PDS-456. Uh, this is a quasar in a very nice location, close to the galactic center. It's a latitude of only plus 11 degrees. It's very hard to find UV bright quasars there, uh, but this is in a low extinction window where we can see uh, a nice bright UV flux. So we got a spectrum of this um, with COS in the UV several years ago, and we immediately noticed that there were several high velocity clouds in this spectrum. This is silicon-3, the 1206 line, and you see here the different colors are the shaded components. There's three high-velocity clouds in one direction there. Now, to cut to the, to the bottom line, by modeling the velocities of the extreme components here, the most negative and the most positive components, with a biconical outflow model, uh, Rome 1 ran a lot of simulations to derive uh, an idea of what the radial outflow speed is. And we were finding velocities around 900 to 1,000 kilometers per second. Now, as Enrico just mentioned, this also depends on the opening angle. In our case, we use an opening angle of 110 degrees, and this was set by looking at the X-ray data and assuming that the UV follows the X-ray curve. Now, of course, that might not be correct, but that was the best available data we had at the time, so we took the opening angle from that. So with that opening angle fixed, you can deproject the line of slide velocity you measure to get the uh, radial outflow speed along the curve. And that's where this outflow velocity of 900 to 1,000 kilometers per second comes from. Here in the full spectra, uh, we see a range of lines of both low ionization species, things like carbon-2, aluminium-2, silicon-2. And we also have some high ionization gas in carbon-4 and silicon-4. So this is material that is not only multiple component, it's also multi-phase. All right, so we have the, this low ionization gas is thought to be around 10 to 4 Kelvin, the warm ionized medium type temperatures. But the high ions are tracing something warmer of the order of a couple times 10 to the 5 Kelvin. 
And in this direction, there's no evidence for any H1 as associated with these uh, UV absorbers. The limit on the H1 column is pretty low, a few times 10 to the 17. So we believe we're seeing the near side and the far side of the outflow cone. The near side is moving towards you, so it gives you the blue shift. And the far side is moving away, giving you the red shift. Now I want to show you another example we looked at in the paper that Blair Savage published last year. And this is a case where we have two uh, directions projected very close together on the sky. And it turns out it's a pair of blue supergiant stars that are an ideal location for this type of experiment. And uh, we really got very lucky with this. There's a blue supergiant, LS4825. It's at a distance of 21 kiloparsecs. So that places it way beyond the galactic center on the other side of the galaxy. But there's a foreground star less than one degree away on the sky, corresponding to about 10 parsec linear separation. And that's at a distance from us of seven kiloparsecs. So it's on the it's on the near side, probably on the near side of the Fermi bubble, although there is an uncertainty on that distance that comes from the, the luminosity type of that star being being not completely well known. Um, but it's certainly well in the foreground compared to the background star. So we can do a nice differential experiment. We can look at the background spectra and the foreground spectra and compare them. And what you find, I think, is really remarkable. These are some of the most information-rich Hubble spectra I've seen. So you look at um, the zero velocity component here. So that's shaded in blue in um, both directions. The background spectrum on the left, the foreground on the right. Now, there's a range of lines shown here, okay, carbon-4, silicon-4, silicon-3, uh, the similar lines I showed you before. Now, in both directions, you see strong absorption at that velocity, okay? So both the foreground and the background star have that component. But now, look what happens when you go to high negative velocities. So this is a shaded gray region. All of a sudden, in the background spectra, you can see there's a whole range of absorption, very strong absorption in carbon-4, uh, silicon four, and so on. But there's no absorption in the foreground star. It's just unabsorbed continuum. And what that's telling you is that we are, that we are seeing gas that must be behind seven kiloparsecs. We just don't see it in the foreground star. So you're bracketing the distance to where this gas is. So this is the cleanest example of gas we have that we can associate with the galactic center, just because it's, it's absent in that foreground star. Um, and so this is in, in the, the paper reference down there that, uh, that Blair put together. Um, another property of these spectra is that there's a very high thermal pressure in these components. And that comes from some lines of excited state neutral carbon. We have these lines of carbon one, carbon one star, carbon one double star, um, the fine structure lines. And we can detect the populations at each of these levels. Uh, now, again, you don't see these in the foreground star spectra. You see these in the background star. It's in that component that we are associating with the Fermi bubble. Now, once you measure the columns in each of these um, excitation states, there's a technique that um, Ed Jenkins and Todd Tripp developed, which gives you the pressure of the gas. Basically, the relative populations depend on the temperature and the density uh, in such a way that the, it's the, the product of them. So basically, the thermal pressure can be derived from comparing, in this case, we've got the level population in the double two star state as a fraction of the total compared to the single uh, star state as a fraction of the total. Now look at this component up here. This is the high velocity component beyond seven kiloparsecs. This has a pressure, um, with, I'll skip going through all the details here, but it, whatever the temperature, this gas is at a pressure above five. So log P over K, the typical units for this, it is over five. For comparison, the, the ISM measurements, the typical log P over K uh, for the pressure is about 3.6. So this is more than a factor of 10 higher thermal pressure than typical ISM clouds. And one interpretation of that is you're seeing clouds that are being compressed by the outflowing wind in the, uh, the nuclear outflow. Right, so I mean, we know we're very close to the galactic center here. We're only a few degrees below the center of the galaxy. Um, in, the, in the base of the bubble, this is the southern bubble. So it would make sense that you're seeing cool pumps that decompress and they give you these um, high, high pressures. Now let's move to the, to the surveys. Um, in the north, as Ron told us on Monday, there's a clear enhancement in the covering fraction of the high velocity clouds. And just to, to remind you what we're seeing here, each of these circles 
show us the direction where we have a cost spectrum in the UV. There are five directions that are certainly inside the bubble. There's a few that are kind of on the interface, and we're not sure, depending on exactly how thick that bubble edge is. Um, I won't get into that here. But if you just take the inside direction, all five of them show a detection of, of absorption. Outside, you're down to about 41%. So there's a clear enhancement here in the covering fraction. Now, in the southern sky, it's actually a little bit messier. This is what we've put out in our paper by um, Tanvir Kareem this year. The problem is there's a lot of gas in the southern sky that probably isn't related to the galactic center. There's a lot of Magellanic stream material. So we don't actually find an enhancement in the covering fraction in the south. So you take all your sight lines passing inside the bubble. These are the blue and red circles here. We have a detection rate of four out of six. These are just the raw numbers where we, where we measure the high velocity clouds. Outside, it's six out of 11. So we can't claim that there's an enhancement in the covering fraction in the south. But that's just because the background is higher. It's not that we don't detect the sidelines uh, inside, and we have four out of six. But it's just the background which is mostly different. That's the main difference between the north and the south. So no clear enhancement in the south. We have the one direction where we can measure the metallicity from an O1 to H1 ratio uh, in um, the northern survey in Bordeloi et al. 2017. And what we find here is an O1 to H1 ratio, which is about, it's about 25% solar on a linear scale, minus 0.6 in the bottom. Now, there may be a saturation correction for this, because we only have one line of the O1. Uh, O1, it's not a doublet, so there could be some hidden saturation in there. That would push the abundance up a little bit. Uh, it is still surprisingly low. I think this question came up the other day. We were naively expecting to see high, high metallicity pumps in the in the outflow. At the moment, this is the only one where we've got a measurement, and technically it's a low limit. Um, basic problem is, of course, as Enrico was saying, is there's not much H1 in the bubble. It's a very ionized hot environment, so it's tough to find plums, especially when you're up at these latitudes. Now, we've seen a profile in the velocities of the clouds, and we see this both in the north and the south. So if we take the component velocity where we see these absorbers, and you look at the maximum velocity, so let's say there's two components in one side line, you take the maximum velocity. In both the north and the south, this shows a declining trend with latitude. Right, so here the, um, which way around is it? The north is the squares, the south is the circles. And when you're at low latitude, you know, we're up here around 250 kilometers per second for our maximal speeds observed. By the time you're up near the top of the bubble, um, or the bottom, I guess, if you're in the south, you're down to about 150 um, kilometers per second. So there's a total of, what is like, 14 or 15 data points. We still don't have a huge sample. But these are, this is because these are the directions inside the bubble. Um, but there's, a, there's a statistically significant correlation here. And it could be telling us something about the deceleration of the outflow as it moves up into the, um, into the halo. And the fact that we see this in, in both hemispheres, albeit with small number of statistics, is, is encouraging. Now we also looked at the ionization as a function of latitude, and this is, is less clear. There's no obvious trends here at all. We can look at ratios like silicon-3 to silicon-2, uh, silicon-4 to silicon-3, and measure how those ratios that we get from the UV lines depend on uh, latitude. There's, there's no evidence here for correlation. It could just be that there is a time for the gas to cool or to really change its ionization state. And we think it's only uh, a few mega years, and I'll, I'll get to the age in a second, for the, for the time scale of this outflow. So it may be that in that, uh, you know, that short time scale, we wouldn't expect these ionization, rates, uh, ionization levels to change much. But in any case, the, the observed ionization is pretty flat with latitude, both in the north and the south. So from the modeling that Ronmon led, we can derive some uh, back of the envelope calculations for properties of the wind. And these are, these are kinematic models. They're not supposed to be full hydrodynamic treatments of what's going on in the wind, but I think they give us a good overall idea of the, of the ballpark numbers that we're dealing with. I mean, given the velocities that we measure, and then the deprojected velocities that, all, along the outflow cone, we can derive an age, okay, a kinematic age. How long does it take the wind to get up? to the halo at different latitudes. And that comes out between um, six and nine mega years. 
By the way, the reason that's higher than the number that was in your talk this morning is this is the full sample that goes up to the top of the bubble of 50, K, uh, 50 latitude, degrees latitude. The smaller number is just from PDF 4.56, which is lower down. Okay, thank you. Um, so to, to, co to cover the full extent of the northern bubble up to 50 degrees, these observations would in indicate takes about six and nine mega years. Now deriving an outflow rate um, using an equation from, from Boucher, um, this is a combination of observable uh, parameters, the opening angle, the hydrogen column, the impact parameter, and velocity. We get something on the order of a few tenths of the solar mass per year. In the, in the cool gas, so in what we're detecting in the UV. So this doesn't account for other ionization states, like the very the cool, the cold H1, or the hot gas. This is just in the 10 to the 4K gas that we see in the UV. Um, if you multiply the outflow rate by the age, you get a mass. That's a couple of million solar masses. And a kinetic energy representative that by that is of the order of 10 and 55 Earth. Again, these are order of magnitude calculations, but simply based on the UV lines alone. So I want to change gears to something a little different um, and show some work from Jocelyn Hawthorne on, the, on this. Are there any other UV signatures of the Fermi bubbles? Rather than directly measuring outflowing gas, can you see something else? Now, Roland mentioned this morning the idea that you may be able to ionize the Magellanic stream with a, a flare, a burst of, the, of radiation that comes out from the galactic center. Now, the Magellanic Extreme, if you're not familiar with it, is this huge tail of gas that covers a couple of hundred degrees uh, coming out of the Magellanic clouds. And it's just sitting below, this is passing through the south galactic pole here. So if there was radiation that came out from the galactic center, you could ionize the stream, and in theory, you could observe that. So uh, we've looked for this recently, and this is work that's in preparation using our UV data. Now we've looked for the carbon-4 to carbon-2 ratio um, against basically the angle along the stream. This is Magellanic longitude. It's essentially a measure of how far along the stream you go. And the idea is, is, is there any evidence for some wave-like structure here in which when you're above the south galactic pole, the ionization gets elevated potentially by a, um, a flare? Now there's a lot of scatter in here, especially because this is a log scale on the, the y-axis. There's a lot of potential ionization mechanisms that could create carbon-4 in the stream. So I wouldn't say we're, certain, we're at the point yet where we can claim we have cleanly detected an imprint of a flare on the stream. But I, I think the data are consistent with it, is that we do see high ionization levels in general when you're near this out of the pole. And this is just the UV data, there's also H-alpha data. And this is a separate plot from the WAM telescope uh, from some work by Kat Barger that looked at the H alpha intensity along the stream. And one thing I want to point out here is there is a cluster of points where the stream is very bright in H alpha. Um, this is not just Kat Barger, Mary Putman also has some work on this. But it's like the stream is really glowing at the point right below the galactic center. So again, it could be that a uh, a few mega years ago, according to the models, there was a flare. This ionized the stream. When it recombines, you get an enhanced H-alpha signal. Um, so, it, so there's some suggestion here again that we can use UV data and H-alpha data to probe um, what's happening in the galactic center. One other result I wanted um, to show. This is very recent. This is from a paper um, from Yang Zhang and her group or collaborators. This is looking for the Fermi bubbles, not at high velocities, but at low velocities. So just integrating all the uh, column density you can see in a, in a UV metal line. So this is silicon-4, it's a line in the ultraviolet, and it's an all-sky map where in each direction um, they're showing the column density of silicon-4 across, integrated across low velocities. Um, and the, the darker the color, the more silicon-4, so just the more high ion gas there is. So what, what they find is there's an enhancement to see all these dark symbols in the directions that pass near the Fermi bubbles, which I've just indicated. So there's about a 0.2 dex enhancement in the Fermi bubble there. So this is, at low velocities, a signature of extra material. I mean, earlier in my talk, I was talking about high velocities. This is now low velocities, where we can see additional gas. Now, there's, there's a complicated foreground as well, because you would expect a lot of material when you look straight towards the galactic center 
which I won't get into, but um, in any case, I think this is a very promising technique. For so we have more data coming. Um, I'm going to skip over that for reasons of time. And I'm just going to leave with why we think, um, or just to recap the evidence that we have for how we can probe the Fermi bubble with the UV. So we have, number one, these multiple component absorption profiles, where it looks like we're seeing gas on the front side and the back side. We have these pairs of sidelines, particularly this one, which is very closely projected, and we can isolate where the gas is in, in, in velocity and therefore um, in distance. We have high cover interactions of um, absorption, um, and in the north, and in particular, we have this enhancement again against a very low background. And we've, we've measured a velocity profile where the velocity is declined with latitude in both the north and the south. There may be evidence from the Magellanic stream that the ionization is sensitive to uh, a past activity or some past uh, flare from the galactic center. And there's these enhancements in the high ion columns at, at low, uh, low velocities that just indicate a lot of plasma or a large pollen of um, highly ionized material as you pass through the plasma bubble. So this is the evidence we have. We think that the, the UV data are very information rich. And I'm going to leave up myself in summary slide and uh, be happy to take questions. Yes, previous slide. Previous one, yes. The point five. Yes. Both the uh, inverse of carbon four to carbon C. And you explained that this could happen because of some layer on the center. Yes. What is the possibility that this animation also happened because of the X ray coming from the set of the so that's a good question. There are other ways you can ionize carbon four on the screen. X-ray photoionization would be one way. Shock ionization would be another. If there's some interaction between the stream and the surrounding corona, you could get total mixing that way. And we've, uh, there are some models out there for how much carbon four you would expect. And that's that's exactly why I am trying not to overstate this. I think. I think there is an enhancement in the ionization level near the south of the pole. Whether that has to be due to the flare, that's an extra step. And, and, and an X ray ionization is another possible one. What about just the stark and stark wave? We haven't accounted for that. Uh, we, would, we would need to run a cloudy model that had radiation that came from the nuclear star formation. That's a good idea. We don't want to know. I had a question um, regarding the um, double sideline you had yes. in the south part. Yes. Um, so, the, if I understood correctly, that the velocity you've seen was negative. Correct, yeah. And from the position of the stars, uh, it would indicate that if the cloud is absorbing this in the Fermi bubbles, it's on the far side of the Fermi bubbles. Is that correct? Well, it, so that's a good question. So the thing is that there's an uncertainty on the distance to the star. It's 7 plus or minus 1.7. And that 1.7 really makes a difference because if it's, a, if it's an 8.7, then it's most likely quite a way into the first bubble, right? I mean, if, let's say 8.5 is the distance to the right center, right? Yeah. If it's on the near side, it would be on the front side. So um, we don't see high velocity absorption of the negative side at all. There might be a weak component on the positive side of that spectrum. So, but, but, so this, the negative velocity absorption we see in the background spectrum would be, um, would probably be on the, on the near side if, you, if you're using an outflow model. Because in an outflow model, it's the negative means um, blue shifted, uh, which is coming towards you. Right, so right. if it was on the far side, then it would go towards the negative side. But this is, but, but we don't know exactly where the foreground star is with with respect to the boundary of the Fermi bubble, right? I understand so, that. So it could be in the foreground. Yeah. It would be more likely to be in the background and flow towards the center, which would then perhaps question if if you if all the clouds just follow uniformly your outflow model, or if there was also some turbulence that leads to some random performance. But, but I, I don't follow why it would be more likely that it would be falling in on the far side. I mean, all we can see is that it's, it's negative velocity here, and then there is a weak component at um, positive velocity. So it's certainly asymmetric, and that there's more on one side than the other. 
Well, because you have all the face space on the far side and a little bit of face space on, on the box side. It's at least equally likely to be on the far side. I, I'm okay with that. It's, it's not seen in the, in the foreground star spectrum. And in fact, in this paper, Blair's careful not to um, discuss the kinematic outflow models too much. And for him, this is gas beyond 7 kiloparsecs that's likely associated with the galactic center. Um, but I will tell you this, if it's inflowing from the far side, it's an incredibly high column density. Uh, this is um, the strongest color four line of any known Milky Way direction. I mean, this is an extremely strong saturated absorber. So, you know, it, it, it looks very much like that would be associated with the galactic center in some way, especially because we're only a few degrees latitude below the galactic center. Right. Okay. I also have a small comment on your point five that uh, I also mentioned. That uh, that you see the enhanced from poor to carbon to an HFR. I think that's a very cool observation, and it does tell you that there was an Asian activity in the past at the galactic center, and there are a few number of you know pieces of evidence suggesting that we had an Asian activity. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we are probing for. Agreed. What is this consistent with is that there was an Asian activity. Agreed. That, that's a very good point. It puts more to the AGM than the bubble. Yep. Yeah. The thing that's jumped out at me um, since uh, the very first thing I did to ask you this is to measure carbon 1 5 structure by a certain jank that took time trip within middle school. <laughs> <laughs> is that uh, that measurement is a very robust measure of, of pressure. It depends only on atomic physics, and it, it's quite modern. The fact that you're seeing a pressure more than order of magnitude greater yeah. uh, is clinching evidence for the shock, the light monster greater. But it compresses the pump. Yes. Yeah. To get that kind of pressure up there, you have to have a large pressure difference between outside the bubble and within where that cloud is. Okay. It's not it's not pressure equilibrium, it's not close to pressure equilibrium. That is, you know, it's hard to get around that because that's not there's no assumptions in there. Yeah, it's a bit of an Yeah, and we see a lot of ionization material in the same component. So if there's a shock that's responsible for this, it may be that some of the other species could be shocked. One of the things that I understand is, is, is the exact amount of points is my different line Carlo. Yes, uh, I didn't mention that, right. So the component, because there's several lines of C1 star, and so uh, they've done a, a, a PTF of the sure. observations. So, yeah, so this is one component. That they're greater compared to both of them. How else do you get there? Exactly. That's the, the only way you can get up there is about 10 in the bottom. Yeah. So I would uh, follow the Mark's question. Uh, again, I, uh, is this calculation, when you mentioned the temperature, is this calculation of uh, excited state to ground state measurement done in uh, with the assumption of collisional equilibrium or non equilibrium calculations also going to? Uh, you know the answer to that? I'm not sure. expert on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what you're measuring is uh, the density. Because it's it's you're measuring absorption lines that uh, come from different fine structure levels of the ground state, and so the relative populations of those levels, once you in the gas that's hot enough to excite them into like a pulse. Well, okay, but in low density, everything goes down to the ground state, but as the density goes up, you'll start approaching Boltzmann populations in those levels, and so whether or not you can get there depends on the ambient density, and so. Uh, yeah, uh, you can see there's two different models there. One is with a temperature 300K, one is a temperature 80K. Uh, but, uh, you know, either of those, when you ask what's the pressure, it's giving you about the same pressure. Yeah, and this is 10 to the 5. And, and what, you're, what you're measuring is that there are different absorption sizes, slightly different wavelengths that have different, uh, that come from different uh, the fine structure levels of the ground state. And that's why it is very modern dependent. So what is the critical density? Pardon? What is the critical density? Oh, uh, it's it's about you know ten to the two or three. You know, I, I don't get any kind of guess off that plot, but yeah. You, know, you can see uh, below, yeah, below, uh, yeah, thirty k 
10 to 4, and let's go down with pressure 10 to 3, there's no difference. So you can, you can kind of calculate in your head from those trends. So, uh, yeah, you have to have a pressure of about 10 to 3 before you start seeing it, the fine upper, the fine structure levels start getting populated. You mentioned this uh, deceleration of uh, you know, kind of latitude. Is that consist of a constant rate of all those projections? Um, yeah, if you do project the vertical component, it would flatten that out. But we don't think we're seeing a vertical flow. We think that we think we're seeing a conical flow. Right, but you have a conical flow. No, you have extended points, which we don't especially the red side. Okay, um, so we'll do a good discussion now. Yes. Okay. Then we'll break the coffee after the All right, so the speakers of the morning would please come up. Thank you.